All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate you making it to this presentation. I want to thank uh, St. Peter's University. Uh, Albert, I'd like to thank you and your cybersecurity team for uh, bringing us in today and making this possible. Uh, my name is Chris Fitzpatrick. I'm the University Relations Manager here at Crestron. I oversee our internship, our co-op program, uh, diversity, the equity, and inclusion, veteran recruitment, and uh, some aspects of our organizational development and training. So uh, I've been working with St. Peter's University in some form or fashion for about 15 years now. I've been recruiting and uh, working closely with the Career Center that entire time. Uh, I'm on the advisory board over at SEAL as well. So uh, I go way back with St. Peter's. I'm a big fan. I know a lot of the students who are here today they also came to the, uh, the career fair and met up with us when we were there. Uh, and some of you may have seen some of my previous presentations as well. So thank you everyone for coming and I really appreciate you coming out. I also wanna ask my colleague, Chris Del Medaglia to introduce himself uh, because at the end of the presentation, he's gonna be talking to you a little bit about uh, opportunities with our company. Uh, so Chris, if you would, if you just wanna unmute and, uh, and, and introduce yourself to everybody. Sure, hey everyone, my name is Chris Del Medaglia. I'm a security engineer at Crestron Electronics. Uh, I mainly focus on cloud security for one of our cloud applications. Um, I graduated school, my master's in 2020, so I'm pretty new to the field. So I could probably relate to a lot of you guys on transitioning from school, getting internships and moving into full-time work. So I'm happy to explain more of that towards the end of the talk today and answer any questions you might have. Yeah, Chris, thank you, man. And, and one, of, one of the reasons I love bringing Chris along to a talk like this, not only is it topical, right, since so many of you are cybersecurity students, uh, but Chris is also a product of our internship program. And, and he was an intern with us, I think, for three summers, right, Chris? Uh, two summers and then two full summers. time. Yep. That's right, two summers and then right to full time. Yeah, so he came through our internship and our co-op program uh, and is now working with us full time and is helping lead and mentor others. So uh, just, yeah, I, I think a really good look and a great product of the program. So a uh, little bit of a high level on me. Uh, so I mentioned I've been in talent acquisition for about 15 years now uh, and some of the areas of expertise you see there. Uh, my bachelor's is in business from Montclair State. My master's is in organizational management from the University of Arizona Global Campus. Um, proud to say I'm a husband and a father, big Packer fan. Uh, and uh, as you'll get a little bit of a taste of, I have a little bit of a kind of a game show host sort of DNA uh, and never invite me to be a part of your golfing foursome unless you want to come in dead last and get the prize for most honest. Other than that, uh, these are some areas that I like to talk about fairly frequently. Communication is one of my favorite topics. Um, anybody who wants to keep in touch with me after the uh, after the presentation's over, there's a lot of different ways to do it. A lot of ways on social media. I've pasted some of those in the chat box as well. Uh, but you can find me on YouTube. This presentation will be on the YouTube channel. Uh, you'll see their uh, Twitter, you see Instagram, as well as LinkedIn. Of course, LinkedIn is a great way to connect with me. A number of you have already connected with me on LinkedIn through the career fairs and other presentations. And uh, hopefully you like some of the content that I'm able to put up there. So uh, please keep in touch. Let's keep the conversation going beyond just today. Um, and uh, what I wanna do today is focus on four different categories of communication, right? Communication is a big topic. It's a huge umbrella and it entails a lot of different discussion topics. And we could legitimately probably spend four straight consecutive hours talking about the topic of communication. I'm not gonna do that to anybody, but that's how in depth we could get. I wanna take a little bit more of a big picture look at communication as a topic, as an area of focus and as a skill set. And a lot of what we're gonna be focusing on during this, during this seminar and during this discussion is going to be the professional applications of communication. Yes, a lot of the things that you hear today, you could also apply in your personal relationships or in, uh, in some of your other interactions outside of a workplace, but we're gonna be talking a lot about how this applies to interviews, how it, uh, how it applies to uh, professional work, right? How, how you present yourself and how you communicate professionally. And I encourage you to continue to look into more information about the topic as you can. We're gonna talk about some of the do's and don'ts for communication. Uh, I'm gonna share some funny stories with everybody. Uh, and then we'll also talk a little bit about some of the best practices as it relates to the professional world, the professional realm. So I wanna throw a question out there and I'm gonna invite everyone to open up the chat box. Or if you want, you can also unmute if you'd like to answer the question. Uh, but when I say that there are four different categories of communication, I want to give anybody a chance to identify uh, some of those. So shout one out. If you've ever seen this presentation before, you've heard me talk about this in the past, you probably know what they are. So throw one of them out there. There are four different categories of communication. What are they? 
Okay, so Catherine brings up, Liz, so we're gonna take active out for just a moment. We're gonna focus on listening, right? Active listening is a component of listening as a larger. And I, Catherine, I'm gonna commend you right off the bat because this is usually the last one that gets identified, right? I'd say nine times out of 10 when I do this presentation, listening is, is the one that comes after some dead silence after we've identified the first three. And that is because we focus so much on how we communicate outwardly that we forget about how we communicate, how we receive communication and what that does for us. So yes, listening is absolutely on that list. Uh, so I see uh, Jay puts in body language. I see Matt puts in written, right? So Jay, your, your call out about body language is part of another larger umbrella, right? Body language is one aspect of nonverbal communication, right? Which is in itself could be its own one hour, two hour seminar. Matt calls out written communication and that's a great call out. Written communication is one of them. And then uh, uh, Matthew uh, Prothero says speaking clearly. Uh, speaking clearly, the, the clarity with which one speaks is one component of, again, the larger, which is verbal communication, right? So we see verbal communication right up there, number one. That's usually what people think about when they think of communication is what they say, right? We think about our verbiage and how we present information. But then you have nonverbal communication and how critical that is. And we're gonna go into some depth on, on the different aspects of nonverbal communication. You have written communication, which was called out. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then you have listening. So this makes up our four categories of communication and the four areas of focus when we're talking about these, uh, these sorts of discussions, okay? So now right off the bat, I also wanna explain why the heck we're talking about this, right? Why do you all as college students need this information why is it important? Well, I know this is kind of an older statistic, but I, it still holds in my eyes. And you see some of the top priorities for learning outcomes in colleges. This is a survey that was done essentially asking companies, asking employers, what skill sets do you want colleges and universities to focus on instilling in their college students to prepare them for a professional world? And right up at the top, you see effective oral and written communication. Almost nine out of 10 employers mention that. And then if we're going family feud, right, big family feud guy, that's our number one answer in the survey. All right, then you see critical thinking and analytical reasoning. That still holds today. You see real world, uh, the ability to, to apply knowledge to real world settings. You go down a little bit and you see a lot of skill sets that make a lot of sense. But communication, first of all, is tops among them all. And it applies to every single one of the rest of those skill sets, right? What good is critical thinking and analytical reasoning if you can't communicate and articulate what those thoughts are to a decision maker or to somebody who may be able to help you move that along, okay? Now, we also see from this survey, which is a little bit more recent, uh, this actually came out of the UK. So we, we, we see here that communication is not strictly a, a domestic skill set either. This is something that affects people all over the world. And number one is verbal communication. How do you express your ideas in a clear and concise manner when you are speaking? Uh, and then you see down here, number seven, written communication. How do you do the same thing, but in writing? And again, this is a little bit of an older survey. I think if we redid this survey today, we would see written communication much higher up on the list because of how impactful written communication has uh, has become, right? Now, there's also this concept called the skills gap, right? I know today, if you go on the LinkedIn or if you're reading anything about the labor market right now, we're hearing a lot about the labor gap or the labor shortage, right? There's not enough people for the jobs and this and that, and there's a lot of discussion and debate about what's causing it. But long before there was a labor gap or a labor shortage, there was a skills gap. The skills gap has existed for a long time. The skills gap is essentially the skill sets that employers are demanding, right? So it's basic economics 101, right? Supply and demand. The employers are demanding certain skill sets, but they are noticing that from a talent perspective, there is a shortage in the availability of those skills among their talent pools, the people that they hire, right? So you see top 10 skill shortages in this particular survey list communication skills as number two in terms of those skills gaps with 64% of employers saying that that was the number one skill that they saw missing, all right? So when you think about, well, why is this important? Why do I need to know about this communication? It's because first of all, it's in demand, employers want it. And second of all, it's because a lot of the people you may be competing with, with for jobs, they may have it and you need to be ready to compete with them or they may not and you have an opportunity to differentiate yourself from them in a, an interview or at work. Does that all make sense so far? We're all good with that? Okay. 
outstanding. So let's go into some of the do's and don'ts. Verbal communication, right? Right off the bat, when we're talking about what we're saying, we're talking about you know, how we present the information and how we speak in a clear and concise manner, you see a few of the do's there. Uh, you see professional, you see positivity, you see the tone, enthusiasm, the, the ways that you present the information. Uh, the use of vocabulary, just showing that uh, you have command of the language. Now, it's important to note that this is, it's a hot topic because there's also going to be certain external factors that are going to come into play, right? You may be communicating with somebody who speaks well, but English is not their primary language. And if you're speaking English with them, you, you, you want to be, be careful not to perceive them as less of a communicator because they're not communicating in their native language, right? So it's important to also bear that in mind and to be empathetic to how this person may be communicating. Not everybody communicates the same way that I do or the same way that you do or the same way as somebody else does. Same thing, anytime there's a, a language barrier, cultural, a cultural barrier, uh, or a difference in background. So what I wanna qualify here is that empathy and communication is critical, is you wanna think about how that person is communicating based off of uh, their, their circumstances or what their circumstances may be. For you, for you, your best practices include being enthusiastic about what you're talking about, right? And, and, and that professional tone and being able to be the professional you. And that's not to say that you should communicate in a way that is not authentic to you, However, I think we can all agree that there's probably a difference in the way that we communicate in an interview or when we're at work versus when we're hanging out with our friends on Saturday night. Can we all agree that there's probably some communicative difference there, right? And, and that's okay. There can be different versions of how you communicate. It doesn't make you inauthentic, but what it means is that you have agility. You have communication agility where you have the ability to understand your circumstances, your surroundings, your target, your goals, and to adjust your communication style accordingly. And that's a very important skill to have. And it also speaks to another topic, which I could get into another day, which is emotional intelligence. Okay. Your presentation skills are part of your verbal communication. Actually, all forms of communication somehow will relate to your ability to present in front of a group. So anybody who's ever done a presentation, you understand that that's a whole different skill set in terms of how you communicate. And it can also be a lot more, you might find yourself more anxious in a presentation than you would if you're communicating one-on-one -on -one or even in a small group. Okay. You also see some of the don'ts here. And a few of the don'ts with verbal communication include areas like filler words, slang, any sort of inappropriate language. Again, you wanna think about the language that you're using in terms of what your situation is and if it's appropriate for a professional setting. Jargon is an interesting one uh, because, and, and I've learned this firsthand being in the STEM field for the first time, right? The last three years I've been working in STEM recruiting. Prior to that, STEM and, and kind of more the technical roles were never my forte, never my area. So jargon was always something that I struggled with, whereas now I understand the jargon a little bit more, but I can empathize with those who don't. So if you're in a professional setting or you're having a conversation, and actually a few of you in, in this case being computer science majors, focusing on areas such as cybersecurity, you may have some jargon that you use particularly well that even talking to me, I may not understand or it may go over my head. So be aware of the jargon that you're using and who the audience is that you're presenting to. So that way you can make sure that you're not confusing them. Uh, communication shouldn't be defensive. Even when you're in a disagreement or a conflict, it's important to, again, this is an emotional intelligent piece, to be aware of how your communication is coming off. Uh, don't be rude, don't be condescending. Avoid negativity, avoid bashing. If you're in an interview and you're asked about a prior company that maybe you didn't have the best experience with, it's important to be honest, but not to resort to bashing that company uh, because that is considered uh, something that can work against you in an interview setting. And then slander and prejudice are always just inappropriate in any sort of, any sort of, of professional or personal communication, all right? Now, I want to see if anybody's ever dealt with this before. When you're giving an example or you're telling a story and the way that you communicate when you're in that situation, I think that we all want to go into those situations prepared to have a discussion that shows our verbal communication. But it ends up sounding a little bit different than what you would want. right? And what you would like to say is, well, I said this, this person said this, here was our interaction, this is what happens. But it actually comes out, I was like, and then he was like, but then she was like, and then I was like, and it goes into this circle. Now as an interviewer, I've probably done somewhere between 
seven and eight thousand interviews in my life, right? Phone interviews, face to face interviews, on campus interviews, informal interviews. And I ask for stories and I ask for examples. I, you know, I do what's called a behavioral interview. And this happens more often than people realize where we devolve into those filler words or we find ourselves falling into the familiar trap of more conventional or colloquial language. And we start using our pause words or our filler words, right? So let me get a little audience participation here. What are some examples of filler words that we can use? Those pause words, those filler words that really don't add anything to the way we communicate, but we, and I'm seeing right off the bat, um, uh, so, and by the way, um is mine. So like, yep, like comes up a lot. I've had interviews in which I have been listening to the person for the substance that they were providing while also making hash marks every time they used a filler word. Now, and I had one interviewee who broke 100 likes in a half hour interview. It's actually almost impossible. And I just used one. You, hear, you just heard me say actually. Completely unnecessary, but it finds its way in there. You know, it's a big one. Literally. Yep, absolutely. Well, right. So basically, actually, literally, you know, ah, uh, um, like so. Like I said, that one actually drives me crazy when somebody says, like I said. It's even worse when somebody types it into an email. Right. So these are all examples of filler words that maybe don't enhance your verbal communication, but they find their way into our verbiage. And at the end of the day, are you going to lose out on a job because you use one or two filler words? No, absolutely not. It, it just happens in normal conversation. Again, you could probably catch me five or six times during this presentation using one of my filler words. What's important to know is if you have a tendency to lean on those filler words too much, and if you need to start training yourself not to do it. And the best way to start is by self-awareness. So being aware of the filler words that you utilize. Oh, Chris calls out, I mean, that's a great one. In fact, I'm going to add that one to my, that's not even in my notes. I'm going to add that one. All right. So when we're, there's another one. All right. Of course it's all right. Everything's all right. So when you're in this storytelling kind of a scenario and you see you want to say things a certain way and it comes out, I was like, I was like, well, fortunately for all of you, I have a list here of 76 ways to say it better. And I'm going to share them with you. And so far, I've not been able to do this in any fewer than two breaths. My eventual goal is to get the lung capacity to be able to do this all in one breath. But let's, let's not count on that happening today. So 76 different ways to say I was like without saying I was like. All right, ready? And I'll send this list to everybody. Articulated, narrated, phonated, recounted, related, said, sounded, told, vocalized, voiced, accounted, alleged, conjectured, considered, deemed, estimated, gossiped, held, hypothesized, reckoned, regarded, reported, thought, announced, communicated, expressed, mentioned, put into words, uttered, verbalized, answered, buzzed, chatted, communicated with, confabulated, conferred, conversed, spoke, acknowledged, acted, answered, countered, felt, rebounded, reciprocated, recoiled, recurred, replied, returned, reverted, acknowledged, came back, countered, reacted, responded, retorted, echoed, reciprocated, so close. Retaliated, returned, fielded the question, got back to, shot back, wrote, corresponded, discourse, dropped a line, dropped a note, established contact, gave a call, heard from, reached out, replied, talked, telephoned. 76 different options to say what you need to say without saying, and then I was like, and then he was like, and then she was like. Now, I'm not expecting anybody in an interview to say, well, then I phonated to this person, you know, this thing. Oh, thank you. Chris just gave me the applause. Chris Delamadagli, ladies and gentlemen, hit me with the applause on the chat. I appreciate that. It's actually a lot funnier when I do it in person, but it'll have to do. Uh, there are always better ways to say some of these things and to eliminate filler words. But again, the most important part of the, uh, of, the, of the technique and the best practice is just be aware of what your pause words are, what your filler words are, and then really to think critically about different ways to say some of these things, okay? Now, what you say is one thing, but when I was 10 years old, what I say isn't what got me in trouble with my mother. What got me in trouble with my mother? Well, it's not what you said, What's the rest of it? That's right. See, I've got a coworker here who just called it out. Thank you, That's how you it. said it. That's right. See, someone's on mute. It's not what you said. It's how you said it. And that was what, that, that, that's always what I heard when mom was particularly angry at me about, uh, about something when I was growing up. And this is the part of verbal communication that we refer to as paralinguistics. And that you can sum up in that it's not what you said, it's how you said it. So it's your inflection. You know, where you make 
emphasis in what you're saying. It's the volume that you use. If you speak very loudly, if you speak very softly. Paralinguistics are especially important now if we're having communication or if we're having conversations with masks on. You need to be aware not just of what you can hear yourself saying, but is that coming muffled if you're communicating through a mask? And do you need to adjust your paralinguistics? You may choose the best words, but if people can't hear you because you're speaking at a quieter volume and there's an obstruction, then you need to be able to make that adjustment with your volume. Your pitch, the speed at which you speak, the rhythm at which you speak, where you place stress and emphasis, this is all part of paralinguistics and is an aspect of your verbal communication skills. So bear that in mind. Now, we've checked off the box of verbal communication skills. The next piece that I wanna talk about is our nonverbal communication. And nonverbal communication can take many different forms. So I wanna again, use the chat box, or if you wanna unmute and share, what are some examples that you can think of of ways we communicate nonverbally? I've got nodding, Catherine says nodding, thank you. Very good. So yeah, this is a great nonverbal communicator. As a matter of fact, nodding is not only a good nonverbal communicator when you are communicating, but that's also a great communicator for listening skills, right? It's showing that other person with whom you are communicating that you are paying attention, that you are actively involved in what they're saying. Gestures, right? Jay said it already, hand gestures, right? A lot of people are hand talkers, some people more so than others. Some folks like to keep their hands at their sides. I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong, but you want to be aware. Right? You don't want to necessarily go into a communication looking like Dr. Strange and you're about, to, uh, you're about to be conjuring something up out of thin air, but you want to be aware of if you're using hand gestures for emphasis like I do. Uh, facial moods, good, yeah, your facial expressions, eye contact. Catherine calls out another really good one. Eye contact is an essential uh, form of nonverbal communication. And this is true if you're in person or if you are remote. Composure. Yeah, absolutely. Matthew, that's a great call out. How you compose yourself nonverbally, you know, if you find yourself getting fidgety or if you're really nervous and you tend to shake, uh, this is all part of how you stay composed in a nonverbal communication. Again, being aware of that. Uh, where you place your arms, uh, standing open. So Matt calls out the, uh, the openness, the receptiveness of communication. And there's a lot of study out there that says that you can communicate better with somebody, more openly with somebody when your nonverbal communication is welcoming and open versus when it's closed off. You know, if you were to have your arms folded or if you were to be standing in such a way that you're, you're almost denying that person access to communicate with you, right? That's a, that's a terrific example. Um, so also a couple others that I'll throw out there, your attire, your appearance, a certain degree of hygiene, that's a part of nonverbal communication. And I've seen this in, in good ways and bad. And again, industries are all different, right? I came from an industry a long time ago where I was suit and tie every single day. Um, I'm business casual now in my current industry, uh, although I'm still very comfortable in kind of this, this suit thing. That's just how I do it. But I interact with people who run the gambit from, uh, I'll talk to a salesperson one moment who's in a suit and tie, and then I'll be talking to an engineer who's got one of the funny t-shirts on that says sarcasm warning on it. You know, so I'll see pretty much the whole gamut of the nonverbal communication as far as the attire and the appearance, but you want to be aware of what your attire is saying about you. And just keep that in mind. If you are a very casual person and you work in a very casual environment, that's great. But it's important, I think, still to be neat because it shows that level of, of pride that you take in that personal brand and what you think about that job and what you think about people around you. It's also true when it comes to uh, when it comes to hygiene, is being aware of that and understanding how your communication might be affected by uh, by, by certain aspects of hygiene. So we talked about facial expressions, we discussed eye contact. Posture is another one. Whether you're sitting or you're standing, your posture says a lot about your level of attentiveness and your engagement in a particular conversation. We talked about gestures. Uh, touch is interesting because it's always been a part of nonverbal communication, but it's even more, I don't wanna say divisive, but it's taken on a new meaning today because with a handshake, you can, you can almost put people off. Right, even if you just extend a hand, if they're not quite sure about you, like even even with me, I usually try and wait for somebody else to engage in in a handshake. There's also a cultural aspect to this, and, and it's a really interesting point. Uh, I'll, get, I'll provide a story. Uh, quite some time ago, when I was a, a student leader uh, at my college, I was a, I was in student government. Uh, I was setting up a meeting with a, a new president of a, uh, a student organization, a cultural student organization that was made up of, uh, of Muslim students. 
And the new president was a young lady who was a real up and comer, tremendous student leader. She walks into my office for our meeting. We're going over their budget. And I do at the time what I always did. I stood up enthusiastic and I walked right up to her and I extended my hand and she kind of recoiled a little bit. And I didn't understand why. And she explained to me that culturally she was not able to shake my hand because that was, you know, based on her, her cultural and her religious beliefs, she was not able to touch another man in, in public who wasn't her husband. And frankly, I wasn't ready to make that commitment in that first meeting. So uh, I understood and I apologize. And, and I knew that from then on. And my interactions with her were very positive for the rest of the year. And, and she took the time to explain it to me. Well, so several years later, when I'm doing talent acquisition at a previous company, I have an interview scheduled uh, one afternoon. And I go out to the lobby and I see uh, a young lady who I identify from, from a cultural standpoint as uh, likely being uh, from uh, of, of Muslim descent. And so now I remember the situation. I put my hands behind my back and I walk up and I say, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you here. And she stands up and she extends her hand. And I, now I'm freaking out a little bit. Like, is she proposing? I, 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 don't, I don't know. It's like, so I shake her hand and we go in, we have the interview. She ends up getting hired. About three months later, we're having lunch at a, uh, a, a kind of a company function. And I pull her aside and say, you know, I got to tell you, I was a little... Uh, unsure what to uh, what to do initially when I first met you and I shared the story with her and she said oh yeah no it, it's different like with anything there's different levels of orthodoxy within a culture or religion and that's just that's not one aspect that I practice and I thought that that was very interesting but what I've learned from that interaction is sometimes it's best to let the other person make the first move if you're unsure if there's going to be uh, a potential barrier now again the the in the first example, the young lady didn't make me feel bad. I didn't feel ignorant. It was a learning opportunity for me, and I'm glad that I had it. But now in my interactions, I try and look for cues that tell me whether somebody wants to shake my hand or if they're either not able to or in today's COVID world, if they're just not comfortable you know, wanting to shake hands with another person in public that they don't know about. Right. So you know, when it comes to touch, that's a form of nonverbal communication that's very powerful and can also be very difficult to get a full, uh, a full read on. All right, any questions about nonverbal communication and about some of the different types and forms of nonverbal communication? One of my colleagues who's listening in on this presentation, uh, he sent me a, a, a Teams message about the filler words and the phrases and he said, to be honest with you or honestly, uh, that's a good addition, I think, to the list as well as how many people uh, will begin a conversation with, well, let me be honest with you. I would hope that that's a given. I never start a, a sentence with, well, I'm going to lie to you right now. So why would I expect somebody to start a sentence with, well, let me be honest with you. And I think that people use it for emphasis in some way. They're, they're trying to say, listen, what I'm, what I'm about to tell you is going to be very genuine, very honest, very true. Uh, but it does get used as a filler word from time to time. So nonverbal communication, why is this important? Well, uh, this is based off of a study that said uh, people's reactions based on different types of communications came down very at a, at a very a smaller level with the actual words that were being used and what was being spoken, but that the tone of the voice and how somebody presented themselves non-verbally had a greater impact on how the other parties felt about that communication. The words themselves are important, but you change the meaning of what you say based off of how you say it so much with how you present yourself and how you communicate non-verbally. And listen, if you ever meet her, don't tell her I said this, but if anything else, this has taught me that maybe my mom was right when I was 10. When we're meeting for the first time, you may have heard the term first impressions or the worst impressions. And these are seven early impressions, especially in a professional interaction that an interviewer or a coworker or a supervisor might have. And these are all pieces of your communication. Your arrival time, whether you're early, late, on time, it is a nonverbal communication indicator. Now, listen, you can't always control your arrival time. Sometimes there's traffic. Sometimes there's this issue, that issue. When it comes to a virtual meeting, sometimes your computer or Teams or Zoom is just not cooperating. And I think we've gotten to a point culturally where we're more, more empathetic to it. But people who are habitually late or who show up without explanation, that can be a nonverbal communicator that can put off another party. So it's something that's worth being aware of. We talked about attire. We talked about body language. We notice your communication style very early on in an interaction. 
Do you tend to communicate uh, very well non-verbally? Do you use a lot of gestures? Are you an eye contact person? Do you speak loudly? Do you speak softly? Do you speak quickly? Do you speak slowly? Do you vary your tone and your volume and your pitch? We, uh, we tend to pick up on that relatively early. Uh, this one might be one of the most important here is your preparation. And I wanna stress this one, and, and I think I did the, the presentation at St. Peter's recently on how to prepare for a career fair, virtual or otherwise. I know I've done that presentation at a number of schools recently. Jay shaking his head, I, I remember, I think I saw you with that one, Jay, uh, before is, is one of the most impactful things in an interview or in an interaction at a career fair is how well you prepare for that interaction. That also extends to the job itself. Going into a communication or an interaction well-prepared rubs off very positively on the other party. Uh, your enthusiasm speaks volumes. Now, I mentioned earlier, I'm a big fan of the Green Bay Packers. I'm actually going out to Lambeau Field on Friday uh, to see this weekend's game. And in the uh, in Lambeau Field, in the, the Hall of Fame area, they actually have uh, Vince Lombardi's desk from back in the 1960s. And there's a plaque on there that is one of the great quotes that's ascribed to Vince Lombardi. And it says, if you aren't fired with enthusiasm, you will be fired with enthusiasm. And I know it, it sounds kind of you know, like it's like such a football coach thing to say, but when you think about it, uh, your ability to be enthusiastic about a job or an interview or an opportunity or a career fair speaks volumes about whether or not you actually want to be there. And going into an interaction without genuine, I'm not talking about fake enthusiasm, but genuine enthusiasm. I don't mean you have to be bouncing off the walls. You, know, you don't have to be over the top, but anything that just shows the other party, you know, I'm really happy to be here and I'm excited to have this opportunity to communicate with you and I'm looking forward to our conversation, our discussion, our email. If you can convey that, that is a tremendous victory in the communication arena. And then your qualifications, you know, and I, that, that seems a little kind of low down there, but we notice these other six things before we notice your qualifications oftentimes. So be prepared to, uh, to, to, to wrap whatever it is you're selling in the best package possible. All right, so let's go into written communication a little bit. And, and I don't know who the author of this quote was, but it's one of my favorites. Good, good written communication skills will not get you noticed, but poor written communication skills certainly will. And this is absolutely true, is when you communicate proper, properly in writing, um, it may not stand out as, wow, this person's a really good communicator in writing. It just gets your point across and it gets your business interaction done in an efficient and effective manner and will probably help you reach whatever your goals are. But if your written communication is not on point, is, is off in any way, it can really have a, a negative or a deleterious effect on what you're trying to accomplish. And there's a lot of different ways professionally that we communicate through written means. So again, using the chat box or if anybody wants to unmute, what are some of the ways that we communicate professionally using written media? Let's throw that question out there. This is why I love speaking with St. Peter's. I always get such outstanding participation from the group. Email comes right off the bat. Yeah, 100%. And that was what I was saying earlier about how written communication has increased in emphasis and importance is because we're an increasingly email society. Text, yeah, text messaging. So using your phone to text message. Emails and letters. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great examples. Recommendations. Yeah, John Paul, that's a great call out. Right? Doing a recommendation, a properly written recommendation is fantastic. Here's one that probably a lot of you are thinking about right now. Your resume is a form and cover letter. Jonathan calls out the cover letter. Outstanding. Uh, Post-it notes. Good call, Jay. Absolutely. Your resume, your cover letter. These are forms of written communication that oftentimes are the first impression that an employer will have of you. Right, good or bad, but not everyone who applies for my internships, for example, uh, have I met previously. So this written communication is critical. And one of the most important things to remember about written communication is not to rely on autocorrect. Now I'm gonna tell this story and I know I have probably about four or five of my coworkers with an earshot. So maybe they'll get a kick out of this one too. I don't know if they've ever heard this story. It's absolutely my favorite disaster communication story to tell. Uh, but some time ago, I want to say about 12, 13 years ago, a colleague of mine in a prior company had, uh, her name is Jennifer. She had just confirmed a, uh, a gentleman for an interview uh, for an internship. And he was responding to her on his iPhone and uh, wanted to get back to her right away. Again, wanted to show enthusiasm, which is good. 
So she sends him the details for the interview and he responds back, he thinks, with, thank you very much and I'm looking forward to speaking with you soon. It's an excellent response, it's professional, it's concise, except he spelled one word wrong, just one, but it's okay because autocorrect fixed it for him, sort of. And what he ended up sending Jennifer in response to confirming this interview was, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to sleeping with you soon. And Jen was kind enough to send it to the entire talent acquisition team at the time so we could all get a kick out of it. And this has become one of my favorite. And th this is nonverbal communication at its finest. I'm looking at a screen with people wearing masks over their faces, and I can see the laughter. Uh, and, and he realized his mistake immediately. He responded, I am so sorry. Still had his interview, everything went fine, but he has become a cautionary tale about autocorrect in over a hundred of my talks. Uh, don't be that guy. Please don't be that guy who uh, spells a word wrong and relies on autocorrect and doesn't proofread an important email. If it's important enough to write properly, then it's important enough to proofread and to look it over one more time. All right, any questions about written communication. Jonathan, thank you for the laughter in the chat box. I appreciate that. All right, so let's finish with listening. Let's talk a little bit about listening skills. Once again, it's important to remember that we think about verbal, nonverbal, and written communication because it's how we communicate outwardly. But let's never lose sight of the fact that we have two ears and one mouth for a very good reason. It's because we should practice listening twice as much as we speak. Now, one of my favorite movies of all time, I'm a big movie buff. How many of you have ever seen Fight Club? All right, Jay, got Chris, give me a thumbs up or something in, in your using your reactions. Let me know if you've ever seen the movie Fight Club. And it's not a movie. All right, Catherine's gave me a thumbs up. Very cool. Let's see a couple people. Maybe you'll give me, give me a little reaction there, right? So not exactly a movie that you expect to hear coming up in the discussion about communication skills, but there's a quote in there about active listening that stuck with me. And it's early on in the movie when Ed Norton is discussing with Helena Bonham Carter about going to these, these uh, help groups. And Ed Norton begins with, when people think you're dying, they really, really listen to you instead of just, and Helena Bonham Carter cuts them off and says, waiting for their turn to speak. And it's a really funny, ironic sort of statement about exactly how we communicate oftentimes and how listening is less about actively listening to that person and understanding what they're trying to say and communicate and instead waiting for them to pause so that way we can take our turn to take over the communication. And I don't want you to out yourself on this, but think about if this describes you in any way, shape or form. Because I know that this has been me sometimes. And I challenge you all to think about how you actively listen. When you're in a communication, are you listening to that person because you wanna learn something from them and gain insight into what they're trying to say? Or are you waiting for your turn to speak? So this is the difference between, and Catherine, you called out active listening before. There is a, a huge difference between hearing someone and actively listening to someone. Focus on your on who's communicating with you, give them as much of your undivided attention as you possibly can. And I'm going to qualify the statement with, I struggle with this. And as a matter of fact, just last night, I got yelled at by my wife because I was washing a plate while she was talking to me. Now, I always hear what she says. I always remember what she said. And even see, Jay, Jay just gave me face palm, right? Even though I know I'm hearing her, and I know I'm listening to her and I'm probably going to be able to repeat to her what she said in a week. And she'll say, well, you really do listen to me. What message did I send her? I sent her the message that I cared more about washing that plate than what she had to say. Just like what I asked you all to do, not telling my mom that she was right about when I was 10. If any of y'all tell my wife that she was right about yelling at me last night, then we're going to have words. Then I got some different communication to use, right? So please don't tell her that. Don't hear with just your ears. That goes back to the nodding, the nonverbal communication. Eye contact. You hear with your eyes. Even when we have masks on, I can hear you all, even those of you who are on mute, because of the nonverbal communication that you're giving to me that I am seeing. And this is a form of hearing. Put yourself in the other person's position, whether it's the interviewer, the other communicator, the, 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 the manager, the boss, the subordinate. Empathize with them as best you can. If you want to confirm to them that you've heard them, paraphrase what they've said and then ask them follow-up questions based on what they've said, right? And then maintain an active listening posture. Again, open, good posture, 
eye contact, smile, nod. This is all part of an active listening posture. Any questions or thoughts on the listening portion or any of the communication that we discussed today? You can type it in the chat box if you have a question and we'll have more time for Q&A in a few minutes. Okay, very cool. So what I'm gonna do is, Albert, are you still with me? Actually, you know what? I'm gonna stop this. All right. Yes, I'm with you. Um... Outstanding. I'm just